Hello, everyone, wherever you are in the world. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, and a very warm welcome to our um, next um, session together, hosted with Gusto and Bravely. Uh, my name is Benedek, and um, I'll be your host for today. Um, and our topic for today is relaunching your company culture, strategies for engaged, happy employees. Um, and I think we have a lot of uh, interesting um, elements and questions for this topic, but um, I would like to start this off because maybe some of you um, understand company culture differently. Um, and it's not, that's the exact point because there are so many definitions um, and I couldn't find one single one that takes it all. But I think it's it's good to set the scene of what, how we understand company uh, culture and just a couple of minutes on that before I introduce you to my two um, um, lovely panelist colleagues, um, Julia and Kat today. Um, so before that, let me just go around what company culture is. So company culture represents the living, breathing persona of your company, capturing the norms, values, and behaviors that define the very character of your business. And according to a recent study, um, for example, employees understood and felt their organization's culture most through company missions and values, recognition and celebrations, and the company's approach to employee performance. Um, now, in a positive company culture, employees feel safe, um, heard, and appreciated. These are three very important elements of how uh, a truly well-functioning company culture is. Um, and it's where they're engaged and motivated to do their best work because the culture empowers them to grow and find meaning and purpose in their roles. Um, and I work myself as a coach um, when not moderating uh, such panels, and I find great um, joy in helping people um, understand themselves and their um, surroundings and environment in a different perspective in a different way. But maybe just to 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 ease what we ease the understanding of how we mean company culture, I collected three of my uh, three examples from my own coaching practice, which I think tells a lot about how and what company culture is. The first one is, um, this was last week, uh, and I'm not going to name any companies specifically for anonymity reasons, of course, but this is a very large organization, a well-known organization, and this employee and client of mine has been working with the organization for 17 years. That's a very long time. And she has been performing very highly above expectations. Um, with, and has been told very recently to give back her cell phone <laughs> as it represents, and this is a quote here, it represents an unfair advantage over new joiners who do not receive a company cell phone. This is what her manager told her, that after 17 years, she has to give back. This is, don't, don't imagine a super duper mobile phone. It's, it's a very average two or three year old phone on a very normal company plan. And she uses this to actually commute on the, when commuting on the train, to fall in to, to sorry to call in to her colleagues, she works as a risk mitigation uh, professional and is saving tens of thousands of dollars a year for the company. Uh, I'm not going to judge this. Um, so she has asked me for help in building a case, uh, a business case for keeping her roughly three year old nothing special company phone. So this is one example of company culture, as you may of course understand. Um, as as much as it is outrageous. Um, this is a negative example of company culture. A positive one, the second one I brought, is a team leader who requested coaching on how to prepare for organizing a value-adding off-site meeting for his team. Now, the team is located around the world, and the team lead would like to provide as much understanding for his team as possible about business objectives and how to make the most of it. And team members were requested to input in creative ways, and together with my client, we explored ways to provide maximum value during the offsite. Again, this is a um, corporate culture example, which is about sorry, which is about communicating um, with your um, team members, with your organization in a good way. And the final and third example before opening up the panel is an employee is um, I, I had a client who is an employee is leading he's leading a small team and would like to have honest conversation with his team regarding promotional opportunities. Now, he knows as a team lead that these roles are not really supported in terms of growth by management. Um, 
and the team lead knows this, of course, as I said. Um, as management's view is, quote, the roles essentially don't change. So why bother with promoting anyone, end of quote. Uh, here we talked about how to instill a certain career path within, uh, path view within the organization in order to keep people motivated. Um, so these are three examples of corporate culture, which I think shed great light on someone um, or, or um, on a company or a person, how they might feel. And um, this is what we're going to talk about in various details today. Um, and with no further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Julia Fulton and uh, Kat Mellingray, um, my two colleagues today, who will be um, talking about these questions. So please, Julia, please introduce yourself first, and then we can go over to Kat. Awesome. Thanks, Benedict. And thanks for that, uh, the intro kind of setting the scene for all things culture. But hi, everyone. My name is Julia. I'm out here in Toronto, Canada, uh, and I'm a, our people and talent manager at Gusto. Um, so I focus on really all things people and culture and, and employee engagement um, internally at Gusto. But what Gusto does is we help organizations build great culture through recognition programs that engage employees and, you know, truly build great culture for all employees, whether they're a head office or on the front line. Um, so that's a little bit about what I do and what we do at Gusto. And uh, yeah, really excited to, to chat with you both today. Thank you, Julia. Kat, over to you. Yeah, hi, hello. Uh, I can see we are around 189 here. So um, heartily welcome to everyone. Thank you, Benedict, for wonderful introduction. So many things that you have already somehow said as a scene, of course, as Julia said, and we can follow up later. So I am a um, French-based uh, Slovak professional coach partnering with Bravely. Um, my um, expertise would be towards navigating change and managing sustainable systems. And um, like this thing of culture, of course, made me think of what values can be or ha 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 should be somehow planted into the cultures that we want to create so that they can uh, last over time. So I can I, I hope to bring some insights around uh, how these sustainable systems can touch our communications, our communication, our productivity, and of course, some stories because we all love love stories. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you very much, Kat. Um, before we before we we move on to the first question, if um, some of you would like to uh, part uh, participants would like to um, put in the chat box maybe a, a question or or something which is interest which interests you within corporate culture and what we are covering today. Um, we'll try and aim to answer some of those. I can't say that we'll answer all of them, but if you put it in the chat, it's going to be easier for us to kind of go through them uh, while uh, the panelists uh, speak about the topics that we thought, the subtopics we thought would be interesting. So with that in mind, uh, let's start off with how um, do we define uh, culture? Um, and maybe, if, maybe Pat, do you want to begin how, how we define uh, culture? Or how yeah. do you define culture based on your own practice? It's it's what you hear from clients, right? Such a, such a wonderful question, right? What the culture even is? You use the word living, breathing persona that made me somehow, it evoked me this, this thinking, thinking about uh, the human touch that is maybe still in the, in, in, the, in the center, in the axis of culture. And if we do anything today, maybe what my, my mission would be, would, it would be this redirecting towards this human touch that somehow everyone has already, everyone knows and can easily identify the ways how how to use it for himself, right? So that culture could be this living co-created environment. Mm -hmm. um, I have prepared a short story from Simon Sinek uh, that I would love He's to sure. say if, if, it's, if it's a good moment. Yeah. Please oh, share it. Yeah, yeah, please share it. Yeah, great. Okay. So uh, he was, uh, it's called, if you want to Google it, if you Google Barista and Simon Sinek, you will find it. We can put you a link in the, in the, in the chat. So basically he's saying like he is in a hotel in 
uh, what was the name, a uh, four season in Las Vegas, to be to be to be exact. <laughs> so he is in the hotel, entering the lobby, and he feels like really welcome. He feels seen. He feels genuinely uh, served by all the staff. And there is a small coffee stand. So he stops by the coffee stand. He gets a coffee, and the barista is is very heartful. A little like he, he he's seen that he's enjoying what he's doing so he engages a conversation and he says oh so i would be very curious are you happy doing your job and the barista answers oh yes i love my job so the conversation goes on and and simon says hmm i would like to know um what would be the thing that is happening here for you that could happen also, also to me that would make me love my job. And he says, oh, it's very easy, actually. Uh, I have my managers, and not only my managers, but all the managers that are just, oh, through, through my day, they are just popping up and, and asking me, oh, how is it going? Is there anything that you need to do your work better? Right, so there is this small detail of making people be seen in the moment, in the moment and create these very easily actionable, sustainable, somehow container where things can be told and, and enhanced like instantly on the go. And then he comments, oh, by the way, I'm also working in Caesar Palace just next, uh, next whatever. And the situation there is very different because my managers are somehow uh, check in on our of whether we are doing things right yeah so i'm doing myself very tiny and trying to just wait until the day goes by to get my paycheck so i just find that this is a wonderful example on on how exactly the same person doing the same job the same competencies just depending on how sustainable its environment is can really create completely different added value and a result and maybe a culture um, I would like to know like is this something that you would call culture if you want to come and like I yeah please go on I'm thank done you, <laughs> thank you Kev, for sharing that that's a that's a really uh, true and really lifelike story and, and it shows how people can be moved or unmoved by global culture um Julia do, do you, what, what do you think of yeah, I'll, I'll add a bit of a, culture. Yeah. a take of how to, I'll talk about maybe how not to define culture, which is I think there's been this um, just influx of of like in job postings and in, in your employer branding of people kind of mistaking perks and benefits for culture. So like we have great culture. For example, we have 50 ping pong tables in our office and we have pizza parties every Friday. It's like those things are fun and and good and can drive you know they're they're good in their own way but I think mistaking them for culture um, uh, or you know suggesting that those things are culture is a mistake um, at Guso we sort of think about culture as like the character of your organization so how you act how you behave how you make decisions um, sort of our shared way of doing at the organization and so while there can be really you know fun things like pizza parties um i think that has not you know you can you can have really great pizza parties and, and really great you know social events and that kind of thing but if your shared way of behaving and making decisions is such that employees don't feel um engaged or they don't feel appreciated then you're missing the mark um yeah mm -hmm. okay Th thank you for sharing that uh, what do you guys think what type of culture is the goal and one in which employees are happy and engaged, or how has the definition of great culture changed in the past several years? Julie, I think this differs from, yeah, sure, from organization to organization. Like, I, I think good. I, I, my take is that like there's not good culture and bad culture, and then like companies are somewhere along the spectrum. I think cultures can be different from one another and can be good for some employees and maybe not so good for others. And so I think like matching culture with the talent that you're attracting um, is important there too. Um, and yeah. to that, I think I would also add that um, 
finding people who are willing and able to to actively shape the culture instead of just being mm -hmm. um i don't know what would i call it the kind of passive participants is important um to 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 see when when something is going right and also to see when something is not done done right um in a, in a large way i think corporate culture is also about communication and we'll touch upon that a bit later here mm -hmm. um great Kat, anything on this um, second part that you have in your mind? Maybe you, do you want to share yeah, what type of just... culture is the goal? Yeah, maybe maybe I would I would call it a whole, right? The only thing that can work is uh, a whole culture that is integrating whole persons, right? Like if, mm -hmm. if we see uh, employees and the, 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 the leading part as, as, as a whole, it there's always a place for adjustment and for uh and another try even if things are not working right it, it mm -hmm. keeps things again sustainable okay to this a bit relating question from the from tracy uh here from the audience is what are some top strategies to keep virtual employees engaged and happy <laughs> Okay, yeah, so this, this was quite a conversation. This was quite a conversation when we were all locked, locked everywhere, <laughs> and there were things like creating, um, creating spaces where they can be seen and where they can express themselves uh, safely, to be mm -hmm. able to bring up things that are just existing in their world. That was eventually creating this this feeling of belonging. Um, yeah, Julia, maybe do you have some? Yeah, I do. I think I think it depends on what you're talking about with helping remote employees feel engaged, because I think there are some really great, you know, companies, shout out to Wavy, uh, who do really great culture building in terms of um, social events. And that's kind of like one bucket of culture. But I think, you know, if you're talking about building an all around great culture and for remote employees or for anyone. To me, I think people really wanna feel engaged. People really wanna feel like the work they're doing ties to the value of the company and that they wanna feel appreciated for the work they're doing. And so I think if you're talking more broadly about culture, like a lot of that comes down to like leadership styles, management styles, how like, do you have a culture of, you know, uh, of great feedback and great communication and great recognition at, at your company. Um, those are things that like, if we're thinking about it a little bit more broadly that, that I'd be thinking about. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Um, one thing that comes to my mind on, on this virtual employees, because I, I work with many uh, clients who are working virtually is that many people feel completely, especially after the, the COVID years um, cut off from, from others. And that's important to, to realize from a, a team leadership or or management perspective that hey i need to make my people make my team feel that they are connected we are connected um and we do that on a, on a either weekly or even better uh, more frequent basis and everyone can reach out to the other peer or team member and even to outside team members to to see how they're going because many times i, I find from my coaching clients stories that people have stopped um, believing, I guess, is that they have a right to just have that same kind of coffee or water cooler chat, which they had when they were working physically in the office. Now that they're working online remotely, uh, people are just thinking that um, I only have a right to contact or get in touch with someone else if we are working on the same project. And that sh that's an important element of corporate culture that mm. you, you, you need to reach out. You need to take that courage and, and speak with others, even if you don't work on a, on a current project together. Great. Let, let's move on. Um, uh, our second kind of topic for today is, is it possible for a company to relaunch its culture and how can it do so? What are the key strategies um, and how can HR leaders anticipate and address resistance or skepticism from employees or management during the transformation process? If either of you, Kat or Julia, you want to go first, who who has uh, already kind of first answer I can, to uh, that? I can jump in. Uh, my, my thoughts here aren't long, so I'll turn it over to Kat in a sec. Um, 
So is it possible for a company to relaunch its culture? I spent a lot of time thinking about this question. I think it's funny because it makes me think of like a, a website rebrand where like, but I don't think that's how we can consider uh, changing culture, right? Where it's like, okay, as of Monday, we're gonna have a great culture. Um, you know, I think building culture, and if you're in a position where you like, there's some issues that you really wanna improve your culture, I think is totally possible, but I don't think it's like a, I think I'm sure we ought to all agree that it's not just kind of like a one day we can start fresh and like have a great culture. Um, I think, you know, when I think of how to improve culture, I think of first refining like your philosophy around culture. Like I said, to me, there's not a good culture and bad culture. There's like many different types of cultures you can have. So what do you want to do as an organization? Like what's important to you? What what do you want to foster in your culture? So sort of the philosophy behind it and then operationalizing it. So how do we weave this culture into everything that we do, not just how we talk and what's on our website, but like how we run meetings, how we get feedback. Um, yeah, I think the opera, uh, opera, op, op, opera <laughs> operationalization is something that um, that people, you know, you can think, you can talk the talk, you can think the think, but like doing the do, I think is is super important. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Pat. Wonderful. I agree 100% with this same um, attitude that I was considering, like uh, thinking that we have to relaunch culture like from scratch would mean that we have to consider the previous culture as broken, right? As as not working, as as whatever, as lost. And it would even truly mean that the people that are that have contributed, that have been like active essence, living, breathing persona of, of, of this culture, that they have been broken. So I feel that this can make a projection that is not efficient to, in moving forward. And um, like, how can we, how could we go around, uh, what, what would be a good question to ask uh, that could actually work in, 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 in something like, revitalizing and creating a new uh, version of culture it could be really being very honest and turning uh, behind and learning from what we what we what we have been through together right acknowledging putting things on paper listing experiences looking at it at what has worked and like eventually scientifically it has been proven that the best motivation is to motivation through positive psychology like it's really a subject that is uh, my favorite and I would encourage everyone to look at it in your in your way so looking what has been working and really somehow condensing what it is for this people for this team for this company it could be a great way to start something new. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, we have a question here, which, um, which says, is there a way that you can begin to weave things in for a quote unquote new culture and it still feel authentic? Um, my thoughts on this immediately is that it's really up. To, it's not just the CEOs or the senior management's task uh, to weave in things as new culture, but it's, it's the team leads who, who should be uh, in high numbers in all organizations. It's the subject matter experts, it's the individual contributors, it's it's everyone's task and role is to weave those things in by acting differently, by by saying things, by giving feedback, by going out. I can see her come on the uh, overwork and how do we uh, enjoy appreciation because we don't have time for lunches or token gifts. But that, that's also about setting boundaries that, that you want to make time to uh, show your appreciation. You want to make time to to give feedback to people. Um, work is always going to be abundant for in each organization. So it's important to set your own boundaries and thereby uh, instill a different kind, start instilling a different kind of a new culture. But um, I would love to uh, give this uh, question to the to our two panelists here. So is there a way that you can begin to weave things in for a new culture and it still feel authentic? That was the question. So Julia, I, I, oh, sorry, I, Kat, I, go ahead. Yeah, I have a question on this. Like. Does this question mean that creating something new, it means changing something, it's not authentic? Right? Mm -hmm. 
good question so, yeah. yeah like it's um uh, there's only one thing that is that is staying like permanent it's the fact that everything is changing all the time right so making a change uh, a natural healthy part of of our systems again it's somehow giving them chance to live steadily over time <laughs> thank you julie you want to yeah i i thought it was um interesting what you said benedict about how and i agree which is like culture is not just what your leaders do it's what everyone does but i do think that when we think about weaving practices into our organization i do think if you don't have the leaders demonstrating this like it'll fall flat so quickly so one example that that we did we're a recognition company so shocker uh we recognition is one of the things that we really weave into the day-to-day -day practices at gusto um and one thing when we realized we wanted to be doing this a little bit more we are we're already doing it sort of weekly or bi-weekly at our all team meetings um running through uh a recognition um draw and looking at our monthly leaderboard and all that kind of good stuff but we wanted it to sort of you know put a little bit more forcing functions into the organization to be like okay uh so an example of what we did is we in uh manager one-on-ones uh, we have a template that we use sort of like what's been the highlight and the low light of your week blah 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 and then we added a, something into our template of who have you recognized recently and so that way when i go on tuesday for my one-on-one -on -one and i'm kind of you know reflecting on my week i'm like oh you know what i haven't sent you know anybody any recognition recently so that forces me to go and think about who has really like done a great job in the last week and uh and and recognize them for that so i think i think of forcing functions not as a bad thing because sorry there's a, a thing but not as a bad thing but just something that like it's really hard to make time for these things and it's really hard sometimes to do it organically um but do you have things in built into like the way your organization runs that can um, remind you and and force you to kind of like do these things. Great, thank you. And that kind of leads us to the next question quite organically is uh, how, how do company core values play a role in culture and what are the first steps in identifying and articulating a company's core values and goals? Mm, Kat, you want to go on this? Yeah, sure. Um... So this is something that um, I believe exists in, in every organization already, uh, connection, identif identification with of core values and goals. So maybe just actualizing them, um, making them uh, um, just for a shorter period of time so that there is something achievable, uh, positive and possible that is, that is uh, written and uh, like seen by by all of them, then it would be. Um, I'm trying to think of some of my clients. Um, it would be almost this invisible work of individuals that can lead with communication that is. Um, nourishing relationships mm -hmm. does it somehow make sense can you maybe uh, re relate on this yeah thank you julia any thoughts on this yeah i think um a lot of companies have their core values maybe up on the wall or maybe on their you know company website uh they'll have them in job descriptions and sometimes that's it. And I think you're not, that's kind of a, you're not maximizing the potential of your core values um, if, if that's all you're doing. And so this is, I have a similar answer to this as I did for the last one, but like, how are you putting your core values and in, in letting your core values drive behavior and then sort of like acknowledging when that does happen. So examples of, of ways that you can do this is tying core values into interview questions. So if you're interviewing a candidate so that you can start from the outset of like, yeah, hey, here at Gusto, our core values are super important to us. So this question is going to be sort of around this core value. This question is going to be around this core value. Um, that's one example of kind of like 
operate oper I'm not going to try that word again, weaving it into <laughs> your operation. Um, and then another thing you can do is sort of we we have a theme at Gusto every time we have an all team meeting, our theme is one of our four core values and and somebody talks about an example when they saw this core value and so it kind of can engage people in behaving in ways that are aligned with these values and, and can really reinforce that behavior when you do see it. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, absolutely. And I can I can uh, piggyback on that because uh, but my, my thought on this is that core values, if you just say here are core values, and even if it's written down, it's um, it's very difficult to make it actionable, I guess that's the word. But if you translate it to how that how um, you can think about it on a daily active level, what you can do about it and, and the emphasis on doing, uh, being that, saying it, writing it, um, interacting with someone, that makes it so much easier for, for people to believe and, and understand, okay, what part can I play in it? Instead of just being given as a mantra, um, even, if it's, if, even if it is with the best of intentions. So that's important to keep in mind. Thank you for mm -hmm. both of you sharing your thoughts on this. Great. Um, we have um, a couple of comments here, or even more, and maybe it's important to bring in, about complainers. So people complaining and kind of making their mark, a negative mark on, on an otherwise good corporate culture. And the complainers kind of have a, a louder voice than the, the silent majority. How should or how could a company uh, deal with that or managers deal with that? What do you think? I'm I'm kind of um, um, <laughs> pushed together a, a few comments here, but but that's the gist mm -hmm. of it. Yeah. So um, maybe first thing just to not to forget is that the complainer is a person that needs to be seen. So it's not it's 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 not often very much about what is in the center of what is being complained about but it's about uh, an agitation. It can be completely like uh, coming from somewhere else. And uh, like addressing this first can somehow already help to calm the situation and maybe just do the like the first um, res responder uh, service, right? What, what's, what's truly on the table? There is a book that is, uh, pretty much uh, maybe on my table and in my coaching conversations every day you can put it in a in a in a chat crucial conversations uh, i really love uh, what they are like somehow saying as, as a baseline on conversations when uh talk, tools for talking when stakes are high um most of the time like they are saying that 80 percent of conversation is happening in our heads before we go into the conversation. So it's very important to be able to recognize, like really step back and say, okay, what's really going on? Going on? And then um, there are um, um, ways how to go around these critical moments where you can, it's, it's, it's somehow, it, it pays um, more if you push for a preserving relationship instead of preserving an outcome. So yeah, if you are, if this resonates, you can you can you can reach out for for the book. It's a great, it's a great one. And like complainer, uh, there maybe also things about uh, dealing with toxic personalities in workspace. And there are guidelines and and tools and things around that that you can also look for. Thank you, Kat, for sharing that. Yeah, I also support this book. It's a really crucial book crucial conversation. Julia, any thoughts on this complaining? Just comment? that I'm adding that book to the list and Kat, that I really agree. And I think that's really a compassionate sort of view that is really important to hold that like someone complaining is, is probably not feeling heard, not feeling seen. So like, how can we address that? So love it. Plus one. Yeah. I and I see, I see in the comments, like being excluded from decision-making, of course, very much not being heard. Right, our basic human need is to be heard, so that we can have the feeling that we are contributing. So it it goes through these communication things. Thank you, Benedict, for putting it in the chat. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Great. That leads us to the next question, which which we're 
tuning in for um, on on feedback and communication uh, as a very uh, strong pillar of uh, corporate culture. And how that is, how can companies foster um, trust and openness within the organization? And how can leaders model these model these values? We also have a, a bit of an, a side question here on, on do you feel safe with feedback? And that's an important element here when, when we talk about um, corporate culture. Julia, do you have any, you wanna open this? Sure, I'll, I'll start with my thoughts. So how can companies foster trust and openness within an organization? Um, I think a lot of the times trust comes down to alignment and honesty. So like if somebody doesn't feel, um, yeah, and actually caring, I, I'll go caring as my like top tier, top tier one. Cause I think if there's a, not even a culture of caring, but just if managers and leaders genuinely care on an individual level about, you know, the well-being of their employees and their direct reports, then that's going to foster a lot of trust in that relationship. When I think of a manager that I know cares about me and cares about my well-being and how I'm performing and how I'm growing, um, if I really believe they care about me, then I'm going to trust that they have my best interests at play when they give maybe difficult feedback. Because as opposed to taking it and being like, oh man, this person doesn't even they don't like me or they don't care about me and they're just nitpicking. Instead, I'll see that feedback as like, oh man, like this person really wants to help me grow and help me succeed. And I know that because I trust that they, they really care about me. Um, so I think, you know, do your leaders have genuine caring for the well-being of people, the well-being of the organization? Um, I think that can go a really long way in fostering trust. And I saw Thank someone you. in the chat say transparency, which I, I yeah. fully agree with too. Kat, what do you think? Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You just named all, all, all my favorites. Um, trust, um, building trust in professional setting is is such a gift. Like it's a thing that if you if you just engage with it, everything can flourish. Uh, if you go back to the story from Simon on the beginning, like all the all the elements that we have to have on mind when we try to build trust and somehow put the employees or whatever, or all the team, uh, on motivate them and put them on this um, uh, natural propulsion forward. <laughs> so you have these article of neuroscience of trust that have been put, that has been put in the, in the chat. Um, we have these six pillars, recognize excellence, make people seen on daily basis, uh, discretion in how people do the work. Trust them. When you delegate, don't get back and 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 correct and redo or overdo. If you decide to delegate something, and with my clients, this is coming back like quite often. Like, well, I I did delegate, but mm, it it's not going as I as I as I hoped for. But there is always something. If we inverse the roles, if we if we do the, the role play on the other side, the person can see that the delegation was not not really done, right? You can really put yourself in the shoes of the person you are delegating to to be. It is the only way so that it really works because we would never delegate in in a wrong way if it was for us, of course. Then we have enable job crafting again autonomy. Uh, enable creativity. This is crucial for trust and excellence. Share information broadly. So know, uh, as we had uh, tiny couloir where things are not not being shared in a, in a, in a general manner. Intentionally build relationships. So you have the book. Facilitate the whole person growth and whole culture created through holy um accomplished individuals and show vulnerability yeah like there is this thing like the um only way to success is one more failure right so just be open with this and and make it make it a process that is just co-experienced thank you and just to again to piggyback on this last very last point on showing vulnerability we had a question 
from KC of how do managers show you that they care? I think we have caring managers who just aren't sure how to incorporate that into their interactions with their staff. staff. That's the comment and question from KC. Uh, on this note, I, I also deal with a lot of clients who, a lot of manager clients who um, are not, not daring to show, show their vulnerability, which I think is very important that, hey, I might not know everything about how to manage you the best, but I do want to hear your um, say and, and hear how you're feeling in this job. What is it that you need from me? How can I help you best? Because as, as there are many uh, team members, there are so many different styles that you need to support as a manager. And this is important that caring uh, about someone does not equal um, in, a, in a kind of a, almost like a caricature way, asking how that person is uh, every day. But it's about understanding how they work best and, and getting a constant feedback. Um, constant being, you know, when you, whenever you're working on a project on a day-to-day -day basis, how did this go? How, how would you like to do it tomorrow or the next time when we do this? Was this all right with you? That's, that's also caring. And that's also uh, very much about you showing as a manager what, what, you want um, because you what what you really want as a manager. I'm saying this from my coaching coach hat is to grow your team members. That's what they will appreciate the most, and that's when they will say and think that you care about them. So that's kind of the answer to that. I just want to bring this into this before we move on to the next question. Um, and the next question is: how, how should managers and leaders handle feedback that may be critical of the existing culture or leadership practices? Is this about me as a manager or can we find common ground with the person in a given situation? Mm, Julia or Kat, whichever, whoever you want to begin. I think feedback is like so, so valuable and it can feel so like gross, right? Like it can feel so hard to hear sometimes and you might get a lot of like sticky feelings with it. But I think the more like as openly as you can receive feedback, and, you know, assuming benevolence, like assuming, you know, the person giving you the feedback is doing it to help you grow or to help the organization get better um, is important. So as, you know, as a manager, as a leader, it's hard, but putting aside your ego and putting aside like how it might kind of feel crappy um, to ask more about the feedback, uh, ask, you know, ask questions about where it's coming from, what context is it being seen in, um, but really like thank, just being open, being having gratitude for the feedback and reframing it as like, I'm doing something wrong as a manager to this person trying to help me grow and improve. And maybe yeah. before I, I give you the word, uh, Kat, just, just from the audience, if, if you would like to just put in the chat, when was the last time um, that the feedback was, you remember that a feedback was successfully communicated and what did you notice about that situation? Just think about that while we hear Kat on this topic. Yeah, great. So um, you just used a, a great example that I can I can comment, uh, Julia, like using feedback in terms or going towards feed, in, into feedback in terms like, what am I doing wrong, right? We are um, very um, like our human biology uh, is somehow putting us in a, in a, in, a, in, in situations where if we don't feel safe, we cannot use our analytical brain, yeah? So if you go towards feedback with asking for something negative, your system just wants to run away and you will not even be able to connect with sense and, and added value and whatever can be helpful that is coming intentionally, like from a, with a good intention. So how can you go around this is like really finding wording that somehow keeps things calm and safe? Like, hmm, could we take time to look at what has worked in last project? Yeah, what was that uh, worked well? And what is that I could be doing better next time? Yeah, this creates huge difference. And this somehow enables you to stay safe and be able to hear the message right there is maybe one thing that we are not talking in enough about when we are talking about feedback is that negative feedback rarely leads 
to any enhancement. That's right. Because of how we are wired. When we hear something negative, our like uh, reaction that is coming from a very long time ago is to go find other allies. Yeah, we can still pretend that we are somehow brave and we are okay with all these things, but it's just pretending. It's not the real thing. So yeah, maybe just some ideas on how to how to how to how to make it more enjoyable and constructive. And do we have do we have some comments or um, no, we don't yet. Yeah, just the situations. If you have a good memories of, of feedback, I would we would love to um, read them out loud because it can I believe that it can help others to to be able to remind of what is working. Absolutely. One, Thank you. one thing too, if you're the feedback giver, either as a manager or as anybody, is to think about like to your point, Kat, how that person is going to best receive that feedback. And it could it could be different for everybody. Some people just want it straight up immediately, just you know, uh, I I can take it, and other people can't, and that is so okay too. So something we have at Gusto is, is all of our leaders and managers put together something called a user manual. So it's essentially like, a, hey, I'm Julia. These are the times that I'm sharpest at. These are the times that I like taking meetings. This is a picture of my cat. Here's how I like to receive feedback, and and so you can kind of like verbalize that that might be different for everybody and then you know when you're work when you have a close working relationship with that person considering how they're going to best respond to and receive feedback when you are maybe delivering something difficult absolutely thank you for sharing these yeah i think we have a couple of comments coming in which everyone can read uh, so i'm not going to read them out loud but to, the, to this point um and i guess we're leading on to the, the, the final questions here. So how, how can you build a culture of recognition into your workplace at Gusto, Julia? I, I yeah, I, I mentioned a couple of these examples. I think the, the one, the first thing is like, don't just talk about it, but do it. So weave it into one-on-ones, weave it into all team meetings, you know, gamify it, have things like monthly leaderboards, draws, all of that kind of thing. Um, but I, I think the other thing is help ensuring that, you know, if you really want a, any HR program to stick, so say you're trying to implement a recognition program, helping your leaders and managers, the people who are really going to be driving this, see the value of it, mm -hmm. where like, it's not, it's not just a nice thing to do, though that's a great reason as well. Um, it also, you know, can drive productivity, it can drive um, engagement, and it can really be a competitive advantage to your organization. So I think step one is like talking the language of the people who are, you know, making these decisions and the people who are going to be driving these behaviors, ensuring they understand the value of it, and then like, put that into how you operate as an organization. Um, other little things, and I think this goes along with feedback too, of like being specific. So just not just like, hey, great job on your presentation, but like, what was the situation? What was the action that was great? And what was the result to the organization? Because that way you can you can drive behaviors that you want to continue seeing. You can drive behaviors that are in line with your core values, um, all that kind of great stuff. Thank you. Yeah, it's a great, great uh, uh, input. Thank you. And Kat, from you, I would like to ask, in what ways can companies support both the professional growth and personal well-being of their employees? What do you see oh. from the Bravely perspective? Well, like from um, my experience, um, supporting individuals on being able to have conversations with coaches in a safe space is creating a lot of positive, positive impact. So I don't know if, if this needs any more um, spe spe specifications. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. This is what we are doing it bravely, right? <laughs> exactly, yes. I'm also a colleague in this sense. I'm not a moderator. So from, from a collegial perspective, I also support what you're saying. Absolutely. that We, we, we provide safe uh, spaces where you can articulate your th thoughts and and think about yourself and why you behave the way you do, why you give certain reactions, can those reactions um, be altered uh, for your own benefit? 
um, and what what would happen if you did something differently from tomorrow onwards. Um, you know, just getting into the habit of of giving feedback, of asking for feedback. Um, and I hear so, we have so many at, at Bravely, at least, but I'm sure Julia, you can support this. That we have so many questions on 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 how do I manage a performance um, evaluation conversation well? And that usually, you know, it's 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 about a once a year, maybe maybe twice a year thing. But I always I always like to 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 ask my coachy clients that hey, is something happening uh, during your every days where you have the opportunity to elicit and solicit feedback from your manager, from your peers? Are you giving feedback to them that what would you like differently? Because that's the, that then you have no surprises when the official performance reviews comes because you have, you have developed yourself and your uh, teammates and your manager into, or your direct reports into uh, a very well-working kind of partner who, who, who we understand each other with half a words. And that's the most important thing. Yeah, great. And the last question is, what strategies can HR and people leaders use to ensure diversity and inclusion are more than just buzzwords in their organization? And then we close off uh, for questions to the audience. Uh, Julia, on, on this last question. I think this is um, this is one that could like be a whole webinar in and of itself. And, you know, it's 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 such a vast topic i think one thing and this like it just got me thinking the last the last blurb that we were talking about is just the importance of self-awareness uh in leaders and managers so that that's where i might start right where like if you're looking to ensure diversity and inclusion are more than just buzzwords in in the organization there's a lot of things you can do but maybe where you might start is uncovering biases by like everyone has biases. It's not a, it's not something that you are a, like a failure if you have biases, but understanding where your shortcomings are, what you don't, what you're not good at, what you, what you don't think about based on like your identity and where you come from um, is one place I might start. But a, a, another thing is sort of um, similar to recognition, but I think having senior leaders understand that like being a, DEIB focused organization is is more than just the right thing to do, though that's reason enough. Um, there's a there's a huge sort of competitive advantage and and employee engagement strategy in ensuring that all of your employees feel um, feel included at the organization and and that they belong. So yes, but again, I could I could pop off on this. <laughs> Over you. to you, Kat. Hundred um, percent agree and and follow on this. And maybe I can add, um, lead with curiosity. Because okay. if curiosity is 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 uh, is baseline, um, then just everything naturally finds its place and articulation. Great, thank you very much. Um, I would like to give the audience. Um, a continued chance to ask questions because obviously you have been asking questions um, in the last few minutes before we close, close off. One question which I noted from the beginning was that what two or three things have the biggest positive impact on corporate culture and employee work life from your perspectives and experiences, uh, Kat and Julia? I read that out again, um, just to make it easier. What two or three things have the biggest positive impact on corporate culture and employee work life? I can I can, I can go first. I Please. would say safe environment, quality of relationships, and courage to have a vision that is clear and shared. Thank you. Well said. I would say, uh, I'll steal one cat. I would say shared vision. I would say feeling recognized for the work that you're doing to drive that shared vision. And I would say feeling like genuinely cared for by, by leaders at the organization. Great. Thank you. Thank you for the complete and whole answers you all gave today. Um, I don't see any uh, other questions coming into the chat. 
Um, so maybe we'll just close off with a few um, slides um, of what we do here at um, Gusto and also at Bravely. Um, I would like to ask my colleague Barbara to thank you. So Bravely is a training and coaching platform that provides employees with personalized professional um, coaching. And um, basically, uh, we also provide training, um, fueling higher levels of engagement and performance. And we now offer fully personalized leadership coaching called Bravely Advanced, which is unlimited high frequency coaching, skill assessments, and robust reporting that develop your critical talent for maximum impact on your organization. That's about Bravely. Um, and about Gusto, the next slide, um, I'll let Julia take on this. Yes, Gusto is, uh, we, we help HR and operations leaders create recognition programs that engage employees from head office to the front line. Um, this document here, gusto.com slash culture advantage, does a way better job explaining all the things I just tried to uh, explain in this hour. So do check it out. It's kind of our one-stop shop for all things culture building. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that, that's Gusto. Thank you very much. And I want to thank once again uh, to Julia and Kat, my two colleagues here for in today's panel, and all of you in the audience uh, who have um, remained with us, which is quite a large number here from compared from the beginning, that I hope you uh, enjoyed it and not just enjoyed it, but learned a lot from uh, today's uh, panelists um, where we touched and delved quite deeply into corporate culture. And we have many of these are uh, marketing um, um, and um, uh, discussion sessions coming up uh, where you can learn a lot about uh, some of our most common topics that we deal with clients on a daily and weekly basis. So we hope to welcome you again in one of our next sessions. And thank you very much for being with us today here. My name is Benedict Frank. Thank you.